You're checking in with the doctor for the greatest fantasy baseball podcast in the world, starring your hosts, Dr. Fantasy. I'm ready to rock and roll today. And Rye Dog. A Harrison Masturbator. Welcome to Doc and Dog, your fantasy baseball geniuses, presented by the Fantasy Holics. What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Doc and Dog, presented by the Fantasy Holics. My name is Jordan Jica, aka Doctor Fantasy, and I am here with my co-host Rye Dog. And Rye Dog, we are talking Tampa Bay Rays today. I know I'm a little higher on them than you, but how are you feeling about the Rays? I I still think they're a playoff team for the record. All right, that's fair. Wild card team. I think so. And I think that's fair. I think most people have them in that range. Um, so if you haven't tuned in before, right now we are in the middle of our MLB mini series. We are breaking down each and every roster for fantasy purposes, going through their lineup, rotation, any prospects uh, that might make an impact this year. So this is presented by the Fantasy Holics. If you don't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us at Fantasy Holics One on Twitter. And check out the new website, thefantasyholics.com. Lots of content on there. So let's kick it off with their lineup. Batting first for them, playing second base, Brandon Lowe. He also has first base and outfield eligibility, so multi-position there. He's currently going pick 201, which I was a little surprised at. But uh, he had limited at-bats last year, but I actually really like his upside, especially batting at the top of this lineup. He had 80 runs scored, 25 home, or I think he has the ability to score 80 runs, 25 home runs, 80 RBIs. Um, And batting at the top of that lineup, going pick 201, with second base being a shallow position, I like that uh, value for him. You know, and I completely agree. I mean, Lowe started off hot last year, and he started off real hot, actually. So uh, to see him at pick 201 um, with all the – eligibility he possesses it should be an interesting th- uh it should be an interesting year if we do have one to see how he does especially at the top of the lineup that's excellent value yeah i agree uh betting behind him in the outfield is austin meadows in the two spot he's currently going pick 41 and for some reason out of all of the episodes that we've done austin meadows was one of the biggest guys that i struggle with I mean, in that position, he had a great season. He was a huge prospect coming up with the Pirates. Uh, You know, he he has the ability to hit 30 home runs, 85 RBIs, 80 runs scored, steal some bases. So I I kind of equate him to Starling Marte a little bit, going almost 10 picks later. So, But he's not as safe as Starling Marte. He He also offers more upside. So I honestly am on the fence with this. I get why he's going pick 41. But I still almost would rather wait a little bit and get Robles or Loriano, Conforto, other guys that are going in that pick 80 to 110 range. So I understand based on a season he had last year why he's going that high. I think he still has more upside, but I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm not crazy about that draft position. I'm not either, and I I, I was I was going to write a note on there uh, before we were discussing before we talked about it, but. He the pick forty one is high. That's yeah. the those are the guys you want to know if like okay, does my gut tell me he can do it again this year, and or is he just a guy that's his ceiling is top, but you know he's a really really safe pick. And to me, he's just neither of those yet. And at pick forty one, I mean, I'd rather take Ozuna probably twenty picks later. So. I, I like Meadows. I don't have anything against him, but 41 steep for me. I'm definitely going to take uh, Marte, like you said, who's a safer pick, and you know what you're getting out of him. I don't – it's tough. Yeah, I'm not taking him at 41. Maybe if he was 20 picks later, we'd be discussing him with Azuna and Alariano. But, no, I, I'm not taking him there. I'm passing. Yep, I agree with that. Uh, batting third for them right now – Playing third base, he plays a little bit of first two as a Yandy Diaz, going pick 251. 
kind of an interesting stat. He hit the he had the 19th best exit velocity in the entire major leagues last year. So he absolutely rips the ball at an elite level. So I thought that I would have never thought that he uh, would have been that high in all of major league baseball. But he offers some potential to hit some home runs. Uh, you know, batting in that three spot, he's going to drive in some runs with Lowe and Meadows ahead of him. So at pick 251, he's going way later in drafts, eligible at third and first. Um, I actually have him as my starting first baseman in a league, which I should probably fix. But he does offer a little bit of upside towards the end of drafts at pick 251. Yeah, and I agree. Um, he hits the ball. His swing is so powerful. I was, a, I was catching some Rays games last year whenever they were on Sunday night baseball. So his swing is definitely very, very powerful. Um, he re-rips it. So he definitely his numbers don't show it, unfortunately. So I'd like to see what he does in this three spot, though. He should be able to drive in a decent amount of runs this year. Yeah, I agree. Um, then currently batting fourth for him, they have G-Man Chow playing first base for him. And I think one of the biggest problems, and you, you'll you see this with a lot of almost every single Rays player is being drafted, but the problem is they play the hot hand. You never know. You know, when Chow plays, I actually streamed him at first a little bit last year. He went through a huge hot streak. But then two weeks later, he could lose it to Nate Lau. Or I mean, they just rotate through guys based on the hot hand. So it's really tough to trust any one of their players for an extended period of time with the exception of Brandon Lowe and Austin Meadows, probably. Even Yandy Diaz is pretty locked in at third. But, um, you know, not a guy that I'm going to draft Chow. He's going to go through his streaks. If you really need a first baseman and you're looking to stream one during that streak, he's worth it. But I don't even trust uh, Nate Lau or really anybody that's playing first for him right now. I agree. I agree completely. Those three players in their first three, uh, in the first three players in that lineup with Diaz, Meadows and Lyle, they're locked, like you said. I, I completely agree. They they switched off so many players last year with whoever was just hot that week. So it's interesting to see how they – that's why they win. That's why I have them as a wild card team. They're a great – they're a great, great real baseball team. But, God, they could be a nightmare for fantasy. Yep. That's for sure, except their rotation, which is pretty strong for fantasy purposes this year. But, yeah, I mean, it's hard to trust anybody in this lineup for a long period of time. Oh, for sure. I was referring to the lineup. But that rotation is filthy. Their one through four is just outstanding. And we'll get into that later in the episode. Then number five in that lineup is Henner Renfro right now in the outfield. Um, probably another guy that's going to get consistent at-bats the entire season. But he's going pick 224 right now. I kind of throw him once again in that Jock Peterson category, I call it. A guy that's going to hit 30 home runs, bat 220, 230, really low average. You know, if you ignored home runs, which is kind of hard to do because I feel like everybody has some sort of power in today's game, but if you completely yeah. ignored home runs in the beginning of the draft, uh, you know, maybe I could take a flyer on him. Um, he's batting in a decent position in the lineup in that five spot, so has some potential to hit home runs, but nothing really beyond that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, his, his ceiling is kind of capped. He is a part of that uh, high home run, low batting average uh, category. So yep. he's a decent streaming option if you need one. Then currently batting sixth for him is Yoshi Tsusasugo, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be coming over from Japan this year. Uh, I can't say I've ever tried to pronounce that name out loud, so uh, I'll figure it out eventually if I need to. Uh, he's going to 244 right now. <laughs> no, not a name that probably most people know. He's, once again, I'm probably not drafting him in the beginning of the year. Number one, I want to see how his at-bats shake out and where he fits in in that lineup. Number two, I want to see if he transitions to the game over here decently. Uh, he's made, He was. I read up a little bit on him in his career in Japan. He uh, made the all-star team for the past five years, led the league in home runs. So a guy with power potential, which I'm intrigued by, but I'd leave him on the waiver wire to kind of see how everything shakes out, and but I still keep an eye out for him. Yeah, agreed. He's a guy that you might want to. But on the watch list when the season starts. I mean, if you if someone decides to roster him, I mean, you can't really have him on your watch list. But if he's in the free agency when the season starts, I definitely keep an eye out on him. He's definitely shown power over there overseas. Yep. 
For sure. And once again, you know, he fits in. He'd probably play first or the outfield for him. So it's hard to predict who's going to get at bats with the race. So until that shakes out, it's hard to take a lot of these guys. So even moving to number seven, Willie Adams, who is playing shortstop for him, going pick 249 right now, very low ownership percentage. So realistically, probably only being drafted in super, super deep leagues. Not a ton of upside there. I think he's just keeping shortstop warm until Wander Franco is ready to come up, and I think that's his job right now is just to keep that spot warm. Agreed. Until Wander Franco comes up, Adam just has to do the bare minimum. Yep. Uh, number eight in that lineup is Kevin Kiermeyer uh, in the outfield for him. Another guy who'll probably get pretty consistent at bats. I wish he was higher in the lineup because he does have a little bit of speed. I think he has twenty twenty ability. Um, you know, right around a 250 average. Once again, probably not drafting him if he does get consistent at bats. And more importantly, if he was able to move up in that lineup, I think it'd be a different story. Uh, probably score a lot more runs. But as of right now, I'm keeping him on the bench or on the waiver wire. Yeah, me too. I completely agree. He's not a guy that I would decide to go after <laughs> uh, unless he shows some signs of glimpse, of course. You're probably in last place then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> batting ninth in that lineup is Mike Zunino. He's catching for him. Um, I remember him coming up with the Mariners. He was a pretty big catching prospect, but never really lived up to the hype. He has some home run potential. However, he's hit really below 200 the past few years. So yeah. uh, there is no way that I'm touching that in my lineup. And I don't really think there's much else to say about him. Yeah, maybe they should decide to trade for a catcher. Maybe that's he's not really much of a defensive catcher either. So no average, not, yeah. he's just there. And that's why I, I'd say I'm surprised by that. I think the Rays are usually pretty strategic because even you know, and we're talking about fantasy, the uh, fantasy perspective for a lot of these players. A lot of them play really good defense though, which we haven't talked about. So the Rays construct kind of strategically there. So Mike mm-hmm. Zanino you know, doesn't offer defense, offense. I not sure what they were thinking there. I agree. Yes, he, I'm not sure if he's really a major league caliber catcher, but hey, he's doing it there, and uh, he's getting paid more money than I am. So he's getting paid. That's all he cares yeah. about. Oh yeah, paycheck, baby. Uh, another guy to keep an eye out on that's on their bench right now: outfielder Jose Martinez, who had a pretty good season with the Cardinals, um, showing a little bit of pop. Once again, another guy you just have to watch the at bats and see if he gets them consistently. Agreed. All right, let's move over to the more exciting piece of the Rays roster, their rotation. rotation. Number one for them is Charlie Morton right now, currently going pick 62. You know, he's once again one of those guys, he's a little older now. He's kind of come out and said this is probably going to be his last year, so it's possible we never see Charlie Morton again. But if there is a season this year, um, I actually think pick 62 is pretty fair for him. And just because he's one of those older guys, I always say, oh, you know, he's going to fall off. He's going to do X, Y, and Z. But when you look at a lot of his metrics, there's really no reason you can say, oh, man, he's in for a a bad season. Uh, You know, he doesn't have great velocity, but he has great control of those secondary pitches, gets great movement on them. Uh, Had 240 strikeouts last year. So he had a big season. And uh, considering the season that he had last year, 60 is probably a little bit of a steal for him. I think so, too. People really pass on him because, oh, he's 38 years old. He's going to fall off. Like you say, he's going to fall off hard. But, I mean, like you said, you look at the advanced metrics, he's definitely showing like he can pitch for another two, three years. So It's going to be sad to see Morton go, though. Yeah, no, I, it's – you know, it's kind of like an R.A. Dickey end of the career. When R.A. Dickey yeah. was the young, but that's kind of what it was. You know, he kind of he's never pitched to this kind of level. So if he can do it over, I think he kind of figured it out a little later in his career than most. But I, uh, I, I like him in that spot. I do too. I completely agree. And then number two in that line or rotation listed right now is Tyler Glass now. Who I have an article coming out on this week on Tuesday, I believe. Um, he's currently going pick 73. You know, I was surprised he was going that early, but I think a lot of people recognize how elite his upside is, and that's why I wrote a Cy Young article about him. Uh, I think it helps him a little bit if the season is shortened, just because he's never really been stretched out. He's had some injury problems in the past. I think he only pitched about 62 innings last year. 
Uh, you know, had a 1.78 ERA, a whip under one, struck out 76 batters in those 61 or so innings. Um, so he has all the ability in the world. He was a highly regarded prospect as well. Um, it's just a matter of he, if he can put it together for a full season. And I think the AL overall is uh, a little weaker when it comes to elite pitchers. So I think he offers Cy Young upside. I think he's that talented. It's just a matter if he can stay healthy and put it together for a full season. So at pick 73, I'm willing to take that chance. He's going after guys like Paddock, Giolito, Castillo, you know, a good 15 or so picks, which I think it's because of the injury concerns. But uh, I, I like him in that spot. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you with Glassnow. I'm actually a very high guy on Glassnow. I actually have, I actually had Glassnow uh, in a couple leagues. I have him in a couple dynasties where I have him as my second pitcher, and I'm completely fine with it. I mean, the injury history is there. Yes, for the record, it's there. He can't stay healthy, but you look at a guy like Strasburg, where he struggles injuries over time, and then like only about a couple seasons ago, he finally put it together. So I see like a, a younger version of Glass, uh, Glass now of Strasburg. So, you know, I definitely like me some Glass now. I mean, I completely agree with you there. He's Cy Young caliber and uh, going 15 picks later than Giolito. That's that's money value, in my opinion, since I'm not high on the Giolitos. But I'd put him in that category with the Castillos. So. Yeah. And I think that Strasburg, I think that's a really good comparison because I think that he offers that kind of elite upside. So I like that comparison. Oh, I completely agree. And it seems like their track is definitely very, very similar to how Strasburg's road to the show was versus how Glass. I mean, Glass, though, wasn't as highly scouted of a prospect, but he was definitely a high scouted prospect. But the injury concerns and whatnot, it's definitely a similar road to the show, though. So I'm yeah. definitely excited to see Glassnow back on the diamond. Yeah, yeah I like that. Uh, number three in that rotation, number three listed. I, I think these top three guys are all kind of one A, B, and C for them. But uh, Blake Snell is listed as their third starter. He's had some injury concerns and struggled a little bit last year. Um, currently going pick 38. Once again, he has elite upside. But at pick 38, you know, I think the risk reward is uh, not really worth it for a pick that high. You know, I, I, if you're talking glass now going almost 40 picks later, you know, to me, it seems like a no brainer to take glass now, but uh, I think Blake Snell's going a little too high based on the injury risk and the reward of what he can offer. And I completely agree with you there. Um, he, I, I, I do think he's going to rebound. I mean, but I'm not confident enough to spend my fourth or fifth round pick on him. So Especially at 38, he's got to be a top 10 pitcher coming off the board, too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not taking that, especially with a guy who just posted, what, a 4.2 ERA last year? Yeah, I think early... at the seventh pitcher off the board right now. And that's just crazy. I get it. In a dynasty league, maybe. I mean, but if you're just doing redraft, no way. You're, you don't know for sure he's going to completely bounce back this year for one year of redraft. So I'm definitely passing. I mean, even in a dynasty, you could say that's good value because I do think he'll rebound over time. Yeah. But uh, and redraft, I'm passing. Yep, I agree. Fourth in that rotation right now is Yanni Chirinos, uh, currently going 224. We had a sleeper article come out about him a little while back now. Um, yeah, I'm not very high on him. I think he's more of a middle-of-the-rotation kind of guy can eat some innings for you. They kind of switch him back and forth between uh, starting games and being in the bullpen, which is the very raised way to do things. Yeah, uh, they, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> kind of just rotate. Not ideal for fantasy purposes, but, you know, to no, me, uh, it's kind of a swing starter. So not a guy I'm crazy about. I know there's another guy in our group that really likes him, but he's more of a I, swing starter to me. Yeah, he really does like Yanni. And, I mean, I'm – I do like Yanni, and I think a lot of people really look at the age of Yanni and how young he is, and there's definitely – he could definitely be that starter, that one. Uh, he could definitely be that ace or second or third pitcher. I mean, he's got the ability to do it, and he definitely has the time, seeing how young he is. But, I mean, it's going to be tough for him to overtake last down and Snell. But maybe when Morton retires this year or next year, whenever the season does start, or even if he does come back, um, Yanni could definitely be in that third role and definitely have a uh, more responsibility in that rotation. So I guess you could say I'm definitely on the Yanni train. 
Yeah, and he's go currently going pick 224, so he's the kind of guy that maybe I'm not high on, but at pick 224, if you like his upside, nothing wrong with taking him in that position. Yeah, and I completely agree. Number five in that rotation right now is Ryan Yarbrough. Uh, we'll see if he stays in that spot. They have some prospects that might come up and take it, but uh, he's currently going pick 223. I actually don't mind him. I actually prefer him over Yanni right now. Um, just because when I looked at his metrics, he had a little more, uh, his stuff was a little better than Yanni's. Um, interesting, though, he was in the 99th percentile for his exit and hard hit velocity, meaning he was in the top 15 pitchers as far as uh, hitters struggling to hit him hard, which I thought was interesting that he was so high. So that does show that he has some ability to fool hitters a little bit. So if he sticks in that rotation, I don't mind taking him way later in drafts so and or if he's uh, on the waiver wire streaming him early in the season. Completely agree. I mean, Yanni and uh, Yarborough, though, I mean, I mean, it's just uh, what do you prefer, pumpkin or apple pie? So, I mean, it's late-round picks. You apple know, pie for the record. No, pumpkin with Cool Whip. Come on. Is that our <laughs> uh, next episode of the Master Debaters? <laughs> uh-huh. Pumpkin, uh, pumpkin or apple pie. <laughs> we'll have a pie-eating contest. I remember in the group chat last week, I was comparing uh, jam, strawberry, or grape. Come on, George Kittle, the strawberry of uh, the jellies compared to Kelsey. <laughs> wow. That's, I mean, I definitely agree that strawberry is way better, but. Oh, yeah. George Kittle, Travis Kelsey debates. Uh, that's for another time. <laughs> that's another story for another time, for sure. Um, moving through the back end of their, uh, pitching. Well, we're done with their rotation we went through their rotation. So their bullpen, they don't really have a solidified <laughs> closer in true, uh, Tampa Bay Rays fashion. They go with a hot hand. So they have a yeah. few guys there, Nick Anderson, Jose Alvarado, Diego Castillo. Nick Anderson is currently the most highly drafted at pick 150, which was a little surprising to me just because, I mean, you're going in. That's if you're taking a closer at pick 150, you're kind of in the mid range of closers, like 15 to 20. So usually in that range, you're very confident they're going to get save opportunities. And I really can't say that for any of the Rays bullpen arms. I really can't, but that's the people are taking that chance just because they know the uh, Rays are an 85 win team, yep. 85 to 90 win team. They're in that range, so I could see it. I mean, 85 is definitely gets you a wild card. Yeah. <laughs> We're going uh, 96. Well, they're not going to have play enough games, but this is full season. I'd say 96 wins. That is bold. <laughs> That's uh, World Series champions. Man, you do love you some Rays this year. I really think that they could. Um, Maybe they trade for a closer too. At the, I mean, whenever they do start the season for a deadline, and then they could definitely. I think that's the only thing they're missing. I still think that their lineup could use a big bat, just a guy in the middle of that lineup that people are scared to face. Because right now, if you look, and I think Wander Franco, I think long term, that's the oh. kind of player he can be. But as of right now, if you look at their lineup, you're like, okay, a lot of solid hitters, good defensive players, but there's no one in that lineup that I'm scared of. I mean, maybe if they get, maybe if they trade for Villar, they, uh, the AL might be a oh, little scared. Gosh, I don't know why you'd bring that name up. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking for trouble now. Just throwing gasoline on the fire there. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to hear about that. I'm not a part of that conversation. I'll just say I'm sorry, and it'll be okay. <laughs> uh, finishing it off then with a few impact prospects. Currently, the Rays have the number one ranked farm system in Major League Baseball. They have a really deep crop of players. They have some that are major league ready, some that are going to take a few years to come up. Uh, guys that could make a, an immediate impact, Brent Honeywell, who is a starting pitcher. Not sure if there's a solidified spot for him right now, but if they do decide long-term that Yanni is more of a bullpen swing, six-starter kind of guy, I could see Honeywell making an impact this year. Um, same with Brendan McKay, who is eligible as a pitcher and a hitter this year. So yeah. I'm interested to see what his role is. He's been going a little later in drafts, around pick 240. Ownership percentage is pretty high because I think people like taking a chance on highly regarded prospects at the end of drafts. Um, and then we also have Adele Bruhan, who is probably going to be end up playing 
we'll see long term. I think up the middle, long term, you're going to see Franco and Bruhan up the middle. Um, but I think this season that Bruhan has a chance to play short for him if they want to decide Willie Adams' time is up. Uh, Bruhan has scored has uh, had 40 to 50 steal potential in the minors. I think he's going to come up and be able to steal right around 40 bases when he does get the call. So obviously when he does get the call, he has some value just based on his speed if you're looking for some stolen bases. But any notes on the Rays farm system from you? Um, I actually like the farm system. I like McKay a lot. Um, I like him more as a pitcher than a hitter. Mm-hmm. So hopefully they give him more pitching uh, and maybe potentially get him in that three spot. I will say for the record, I think McKay definitely has higher upside than Yanni. So it should be interesting to see how that goes. And Honeywell is definitely another decent prospect. And we just discussed about five minutes ago about the Rays trading for a hitter. And they have all these prospects with Bruhan, Franco, Honeywell, and McKay. So not all these guys. I mean, Honeywell and – I mean, not Honeywell. Um, Bruhan and Franco, they both play short, I believe. So, And they have a quality infielders. They have low still. So maybe they trade uh, Bruhan and uh, one of those pitching prospects for a quality hitter. and. I definitely, we're definitely looking at a World Series caliber team there. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because the Rays haven't really been known for making big moves like that. But I think if they want to make it to the next level, that that's a move they should make. I'd be kind of interested if they got creative with that rotation, given the injury history of Glass now and Snell. I mean, maybe it makes sense to extend that rotation to have, and that's this is kind of what they do now, but having six or seven guys that all kind of get an extra day of rest. Uh, just to make sure that Snell, Glass, now and McKay are able to perform long term. But I, I think that's a very raised thing to do is to just extend that rotation out and give guys more rest. And I completely agree. And that's that's going to be interesting. It's a good, well-rounded young team. That's what they are, and they're definitely ready to compete. So I'm looking forward to it. Actually, now that we've really discussed it, I mean. They just need a closer and that big bat in the lineup, and they're definitely good to go. Yep, I agree. World Series champions, whenever that World Series is played. <laughs> you can write it down, mark it down. Oh, Nats and Rays? Nats. I don't know about the Nats. Their time's done now. Oh. They had their magical season, now it's over. The baby shark. <laughs> yep, that's all. You need one baby shark run, and you're good to go. <laughs> see another one another 15 years <laughs> <laughs> that's how the Mets do it they're good about every 15 years so they made it in 15 so I got I'm waiting until about 2030 right now so I got some time to kill <laughs> oh no not with Turner and Soto we got we're definitely playoff caliber still. <laughs> oh, yeah, they'll be in the playoffs but any other notes on the Rays um I think that is it for the Rays uh, you've definitely made your prediction with the uh, World Series champs <laughs> I am going with the uh, wild card as of the roster they have now. If they did trade for that closer or that big bat, I'm, we're definitely looking at a new division champion, possibly the you know a World Series contender as well. I like it. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Make sure you like the Fantasy Holics Facebook page. Subscribe to the Fantasy Holics YouTube channel. YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at FantasyHolics1 and check out our new website, www.TheFantasyHolics.com. We have lots of NBA, MLB, and NFL content. We're uh, pushing new stuff out every single day, so check it out. And once again, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.